Hello. Good morning. How are well, you? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah good. Yeah. Very nice to you. see you again. Yes, it's been long. I do apologise for the past couple of weeks. Um, yeah, things just popped up. I'm really sorry about that. But I'm really glad that we've had the opportunity now to do this. So, yeah, yeah really hopefully good. it goes well. Okay, excellent. So we're talking about education this time round, Arvinda, and um, sure. and I know you've been brought up in Britain, so um, I imagine that most of your education, like myself, has been British education, but I know you learn a lot about Sikhi on an informal basis, you know, um, and so let's talk about what we have learned about Sikhi uh, whether it's in the classroom or whether it's informal through our families, through our communities, and what we've learned more formally through our education system. And when I go back to the Punjab, I notice a lot of differences between how my relatives in Punjab behave based on their education over there compared with how I behave based on my education over here. For you, when you go back to, back to India, back to Punjab, um, do you what kind of things do you notice are different? I haven't been in Punjab since 2004. Um, I'm hoping to go this summer actually, so mm -hmm. I'm not too well versed on that. Um, although when I do speak to people that have visited Punjab recently, they do say like Sikhi is different in Punjab than it is here. Um, I think that mainly comes down to sort of Prajad, like now in, in the UK, we have more Prajadics, and it's more, become more mainstream since the basis of Sikhi since Jibai Jagar Singh uh, started the movement. Um, so I feel like there's a lot of like on sort of like a personal sort of basis. Like I went to camp and I met other people that were new to camp. And then since camp in 2019, we've kind of been like flourishing, learning about Sikhi more. Um, they've really like in terms of their Sikhi and their learning, they've really surpassed like uh, they've been on a whole other level, a whole different level. They're really different grants, different uh, um, uh, compilations of um, Sikh literature, um, and they've really progressed in that sense. Um, so in terms of education from a non sort of academic point of view, it's not like from like a school, like a, like a government uh, institution. Um, there's a lot of education in terms of like YouTube videos, podcasts. There's someone by the name of like Rambling of the Sick and he posts loads of content about Sikh history that I've been watching is really mind blowing. And I've been asking those a question on Instagram. Um, so it, it kind of stirs a sort of curiosity um, to kind of engage more with our Sikh history and read more. What I, one of the things that I've noticed is that, you know, um, having been brought up here uh, in England, there's very much a focus on the nuclear kind of family as opposed to the extended family back home. Um, they're in the Punjab, like uh, cousins, relatives, like there's so much more kind of um, stronger relationships between like the extended family members. Whereas here, the main focus seems to be because we live in in houses that are much smaller we don't live we don't tend to live with extended families as much you know we live in smaller homes compared to the Punjab and so for you in terms of our education obviously the nuclear family is important and obviously the extended family is important as well and how do we balance these two different ways of forming relationships you know like i know there's another kind of relationship with the sangat you know which becomes like an extended family as well so how do we navigate like this nuclear uh, you know focus on developing the nuclear relationships as opposed to developing the relationships with the extended sangat and you know more distant relatives i think so during lockdown i spent a lot of time with grandparents uh, and obviously they were raised and born in Punjab and didn't come to, to the UK until like, the 70s. Um, so I learned a lot about the, like, how it used to be back then. Like the, you mentioned that the family was together, they used to do farming together, like, the parents, the, the family would all sort of chip in. And at the end of the day, they'd have a meeting, what was to do tomorrow and stuff. And then here in the UK, it's much different now that the parents are working um, and then you know the children go to school. I think for me, the difference between the sort of nuclear family and the son would probably be, um, I think it's just, so like the level, it might sound quite quite crude, but like the level of gyan. And when you go to South Sangha, you 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 quite you you can ask questions, whereas if you ask them at home, it would probably be you know the, the mum and dad probably won't know, um, because they're not that well versed in the Sikhi, because they sort of they were brought up. Well, obviously, for example, my dad was born in, in India, but he came to the UK when he was five, and you know they sort of made them witness a lot of racism and uh, like abuse uh, growing up in the UK, being so sort of like a major minority. We're still a minority, but um, it's still become more sort of acceptance and more tolerant, especially in London, at least, you know, as far as I know. Um, 
but in terms of like the difference, the main difference obviously is that um, when I go to Sangat, I feel like I'm actually developing a lot. I like guess you're getting like the grunt, you're getting the virtues of people around you, the people like you're all sort of on the same sort of wavelength in terms of your ambitions. So you're we're all together in Sangat to, to get the get by, isn't it? Like to, to listen to Kitan or do Sirin or learn about history or Itias or any any sort of things. So you, you always have that sort of sort of thirst to learn, that desire to learn. Um, I think that's probably the main difference um, from a Sikhi point of view when it comes to that. Uh, and also they're all so, like I mentioned, all on the same so wavelength. <clears throat> so although you, know, you might not be in the same level of your jeevans, so for example, someone new to Sikhi can meet someone that's been in Sikhi for 10 years, but that, that, new, that new person, you know, would be welcomed with open, open arms and would kind of be embraced and uh, sort of integrated into the community quite well, um, just based on a, a sort of curiosity and, you know, so that's what I find. Well, you know, um, culturally, um, I've been brought up uh, with my fam my mother especially, always, my father as well, always talking about kismet. And, you know, like things that would happen, they'd say, you know, jo kismet, which, oh, you know, so it's a very deterministic kind of approach to life that wherever I go, if it's part of my kismet, you know, to achieve something, I will, and if it's not part of my kismet, I won't achieve it, regardless of how much effort I make to, you know, to achieving that. Whereas my edu formal education, it was very goal-driven. You know, it's like you work hard, you achieve this qualification, then you, you know, you get this job, and and it's all to do with like my personal effort. It was as though everything depended on my personal effort. Whereas with my Sikhi education, it was like, no, you know, what, divine will, you know, so there's that deterministic kind of approach, and there's that, that goal-driven approach, and, and perhaps we need to be using both approaches um, to achieve, you know, both material and spiritual uh, well-being, I suppose, so how do you kind of navigate those two approaches? How do you synthesize that deterministic kismet, which, you know, and the goal-driven way as well? Yeah, I think it's, it's quite funny that you see that because yesterday there was an interfaith event at King's College in London, uh, and I went, and one of the main questions, well, that wasn't asked towards a Sikh, Sikh uh, religion, but I think, I think it was towards a Christianity or the Islam, they mentioned like, what is the view on like life? Like, is everything just predetermined or do you have to put effort in? Um, and it kind of got me questioning like, what do Sikhs believe in that? So from my sort of brief research I did last night, um, it's kind of like a 50, 50 sort of um, situation. Whereas, uh, so, so it'd be like, for example, you, there's a level of kirpa that you need, but also you need to put the udum, the effort in as well. So it's kind of like a balance. Uh, the way I kind of see it, and this is kind of like my sort of thing, I can't say like midi pidi, like, you know, the, the spiritual, the, the spiritual and the temporal powers. Because um, a lot of the times I feel like sometimes they're going to say it's just girpa or like whatever's going to happen is going to happen, but then it comes off with like a, as a sort of like a defeatist um, mentality. But likewise, it could be the other way around it. You know, someone could say it, but in a very sort of progressive way and they're probably anticipating success. But I think personally it's like a 50 50 sort of thing. So you know, you get the kirpa by doing like bark and simon and stuff and going to sell sangat. But also you need to put the effort in as well. So be like, you know, I could pray, I could do other dos for my exam to be, again, first in, in my, at uni, but I also need to do like the readings, um, the sort of the critical analysis and whatnot in the essay to get the first. But yeah, I think it's a mixture of both. Mm. Yeah. yeah, because if we don't put, you know, because we're taught kirt kamal. And so kirt kamal is not only about working, it's about making effort. Uh, you know, we could be doing housework, but if we're doing it as like Kirt Kamal, we're, we're doing it in an ethical way. We might choose not to use harmful products when we're doing the cleaning even, you know? So even to that extent, it's, we make an effort to be um, like, not to do damage to our surroundings and whatever. And, and then, you know, what will happen will happen, you know, as long as like we've done our best, I suppose. And, and that leads me to the question about our connectedness with nature and our connectedness with the whole of life, not just human life, but, you know, ecologically. How, with, with my Western education, um, I think the scientific kind of, the scientific method, it teaches us to think of ourselves as being separate to nature. 
you know, we categorize human beings, you know, human beings is one category, plants is another category, animals is another category, but they're distinct categories. And we don't, we don't kind of see that oneness, that interconnectedness, that it's like life is life, you know, regardless of the form it takes, life is life. You know, we, we, we kind of, I, f I feel that I was taught to place things in categories rather than to look at the connections and both are important, both categories and connections are important. So how do you kind of navigate that, you know, this interrelationship and at the same time to know, you know, what the distinctions are? I would kind of take the tip, like the South came from like the seventh Guru, Guru Harai So, um, you know, he was big on sort of like the environment and, you know, he set up like um, hospitals for animals as well. Um, and also like in Gurbani, he says, Mata Tarat Mahata, like the earth is the mother. And uh, for us, obviously, Gurbani is, is, is beyond description. Like, I mean, Gurbani is everything, basically. Um, so we have two solid examples in like Sikhi in terms of that. But also, like as Sikhs, we also believe like the Atma is in every being, like every living being, like including animals and plants. Um, so you know, if you want to fulfill that sort of duty of compassion, you know, we should look after this world because obviously, you know, in, in probably science they say that we, the humans are the top of the sort of the ranking because we have intellect, whereas animals are kind of stuck with the five, um, you know, the five thieves. And it, it, in, in a sense, like with great power comes a great responsibility. So we should be responsible and we should. So we take accountability as well for the way we treat uh, the environment and the world, because obviously in, in the contemporary world, in the levels of pollution and global warming and um, all these you know, like wildfires that have been occurring in recent years, it's quite abnormal. But um, yeah, I think uh, from a personal point of view, I think getting to see kids definitely made me connect more with sort of like nature. And also it's just like, you know, sometimes you get a stressful day, just go for a walk in the local park or the heath. And it's very calming, you know, just to be around in the, the sort of the wildlife and just hearing birds or animals, like just walking around in, in grass or bushes and stuff. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then the other kind of big kind of different difference between the Western education and the, uh, the Sikhi education is that um, in the West, we kind of tend to focus on we only live once, you know, so there's only one life, you know, that we, we just live once. And, and the way we approach life, if we look through the lens of that, we only live once, we will live in a very different manner compared with the concept of, well, life is cyclical and, and there's reincarnation and there's that consciousness and whatever we do in this lifetime will, will go with us, like the garm, the garam and the sanskar will go, will carry those forward. Whereas in the Western way, it's like, no, you know, death will be the end of it. And, and there is, you know, it's like you can live however you like, but death will be the end. It's as though there's a beginning, there's an end, you know, like we, we have very sharp kind of beginnings and very sharp endings. Whereas in Sikhi, it seems to be more, the boundaries are blurred between the past and the present and the future. So for you, you know, how do you kind of use those two approaches, that concept of like, you only live once, and that concept of, well, you know, life will not really end? Yeah. Interesting. I think, um, I think there's also, I mentioned like a sense of responsibility, like, for example, if I start a family or something, like my kids, like what would, like, you know, I'm sure we've probably seen it as well, but they say like our generation, like what will, in two generations time, what will they think of our actions and what we've done to the planet and like the rising sea levels and temperatures and whatnot, how, how would they react? Would they still be in repent that our so grandparents or great-grandparents didn't act when they had the opportunity? Um, also from like a Pantic point of view, from a Sikh Pantic point of view, like how are we going to, are we treating this world as well? Like, although we're not sovereign, we don't have a, like our country or as such, um, but like going forward, like the gurus always sort of planned everything. Um, and even like going back to like, you know, the 1800s when Ranjit Singh had his Raj, he was also, I just remember, he was quite big on the environment as well. He had like a, like a little, well, not a little, actually quite big, but garden in, in his, in his um, court, in his, uh, sorry, in his palace in the Horde. Um, I forgot the name of it, but, um, but also, yeah, and, and he also had like, he also like sort of, had a very progressive mindset about you know, the Sikh Empire and how it could sort of 
progress in the future. So, you know, he had hired the European generals um, in the attempts to make the army better and more equipped to deal with the British when and when it happened. But obviously, you know, he passed away before that. And then, unfortunately, his sons weren't sort of equipped with the knowledge and the competency to sort of rule. Um, but I think it's just kind of having that future mindset, although we're like temporary, like the human being, like we're going to one day pass away. But it's just about having that sort of responsibility to make sure that we leave the planet or we leave at the punt in the best situation as possible for the next generation to do their thing. Um, so it's about having that sort of long term mindset. Well, Maharaja Ranjit Singh lived from 1780 to 1839. And the first industrial revolution started round about that time in 1820. So when Maharaja Ranjit Singh died, the British had, um, they had been in India for about 100 years. The East India Tea Company had been there since, well, almost, I mean, it was formulated that it was established as a company in 1600. So over that 120 year period, they had gradually started to exert their influence through most of India. So the, the, the descendants of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, they had not only the East India Tea Company to contend with, they also had to contend with the fact that the first industrial revolution with the steam engines and you know and, and that mass production and the greater economic wealth that was generated through that they didn't have the resources to be able to compete with the infrastructures that the british had as a result of that material wealth and so so it's as though the industrial revolutions with steam engines electricity then the computers it the British had um, an advantage, which we didn't have. You know, we, we kind of like, it seems as though for a few hundred years, we were just playing catch up with the education, with the scientific method, you know, with everything that materially, the scientific method enabled um, Europe to, to produce. So how do you think like now that we're in the fourth industrial revolution where it's no long, you know, we've all benefited, I suppose, from the steam engines and electricity, et cetera. Now in the fourth industrial revolution, we've got digital cyberspace. You know, here you and I are having this conversation and, and we know we don't even need to have a space. We don't need to be in a hall. We, you know, we just log on to the computer and that's the space is created. It's available to us. And, and, you know, so we're not kind of like having to play catch up now. So how do you think that being in the fourth industrial revolution, how can we use the resources and the opportunities available to us on an even playing field, whereas maybe for the last few hundred years, we didn't have that even playing field because, you know, let's face it, those industrial revolutions happened in Europe, you know, that, so we, we didn't generate, we didn't um, innovate as much as Europe did over the last few hundred years, but now there is no excuse. We, we do have the resources to be able to innovate um, on an equal playing field. What do you think about that? I think, um, I think the first point I want to say was about the, so the Sikh Empire, obviously before the Sikh Empire's founding, like the Sikhs went to like, the, the, you know, went to the missile period where they were like persecuted a number of times, they had to fight many wars against the Afghans. Um, I think yeah, in the sort in the mid 1700s, and then eventually they got the Sikh Maharaja and Jisin consolidated in 1799. Um, but I mean, to answer your question, I think, um, I well, I, I don't think I have like a set solution because obviously in the world, like we live in the West, so we're quite privileged to have these devices that, like you mentioned, that we can just jump on a call and just chat. Whereas you know, there still there still exists like a digital divide. So like, although we are equipped, but we have the power of Google, where we can search anything and learn anything, go on YouTube, learn how to bake a cake, for example. Um, there's people in, like, for example, in maybe Africa or the East, Eastern countries that don't have this sort of privilege. Um, and this divide is going to sort of create like a, sort of a, a gap in knowledge as well. So with the facilities that we have compared to what they have. Um, but in terms of like the environment, I think, I guess it also depends on the sort of, um, the manufacturers as well, like if they make like a super super efficient laptop or a super efficient car, like the main the main premise that they're looking at is profit. And if they're not going to make profit, they're not going to do it sort of thing. Um, 
So like, for example, the initiative to build electric car, which is, I think it's, it's good, but I haven't done much research on it, but um, like obviously it's, it's, more, it's a lot more pricier than a normal vehicle. Um, and also, you know, th there is a big push on electric cars, but some people just kind of like to sort of stay like, be more conservative and just keep to electric or diesel because we, we know it works and we know it's safe and we've been using it for like a number of years. So why not just keep to it rather than change to electric? Um, but I think, yeah, the main thing is about having sort of demand, if, the, if there is a demand, especially from like a private private company point of view, because they're not going to make it unless it makes some sort of gain from it as well. Uh, and obviously, like, renewable sources are quite expensive because they're quite novel as well. So it's, it's quite new. There's a lot of research to be done of it as well to see the long-term sustainability of it. Um, but yeah. Well, the other thing about the digital world is that there is more opportunity now for us to share knowledge, you know, because you talk about learning about Sikh history. And over the last couple of years, I've looked on YouTube and I've, you know, benefited from lots of um, uh, information on available on the internet about Sikhi where I don't have to go to a university to learn about it. It's there freely shared and freely available. Whereas a lot of the education before the digital world was private you had to uh, you had to enroll on a particular you know for a, you're doing a, a university course it was like um you had to pay you know and not everyone could afford to pay to go to university not everyone had the time if they were you know they had children to raise they didn't have time to go to university and study and so whereas the internet it kind of overcomes all of those obstacles in terms of finance, in terms of space, in terms of, you know, convenience and whatever. So there's more kind of um, shared education and we learn a lot through conversations like this. We learn a lot through discussions and we learn a lot from doing our own research into what we're interested in, when we're interested in it, whatever. So do you think that the fact that the digital world has allowed us to share more openly and and also this concept of like shared versus private um for some cultures information and knowledge uh there's a lot of kind of um, barriers to entry it's like say oxford and cambridge for example because they have a very kind of strong brand there will be barriers to entry for for some people to do a course at, at Cambridge or Oxford or Harvard, you know, because, it, you know, the expense of it is like one barrier to entry or, um, and there was like a focus on keeping things private because that made them more elite, that made them more yeah. kind of sought after. Whereas if we just share it, you know, the information might be just as useful and just as relevant, but if it's freely shared, people don't value it. And so, with Sikhi, I think that we're taught to share, you know, Band Kishoko. You know, Band Kishoko is like this whole kind of concept of sharing of everything. And whereas with the Western, the European, there's like ownership, copyright, trademark, you know, there's, so how do we balance these two kind of concepts? One is like, this is mine, you know, and, mm -hmm. and in order to have what is mine, you need to pay a large sum of money and or or to be a good friend or you know like there's something that you need to do to show that you deserve to share in this knowledge whereas the other way is like you know I don't even care who hears this conversation as long as they get some value from it you know there's no personal interest and so so the shared and private concept how do we balance those two? I think from a sick point of view um Again, basic Sikhi done a great job at this by the large thing because they've touched the basics, the foundations. So when it comes to religion, I think it's always great to sort of share the sort of fundamental beliefs of a religion so people know what it's about and people can also like relate to or even tolerate it in some instances. Um, so I, in terms of your question, I think having the sort of basic outlines or like having basic uh, knowledge is great. I like having it on YouTube or any other medium platform. I think when it comes to paid content, I, I think you mentioned there's a great point about the novelty. Like if everything's online and it just becomes like, it doesn't become special, it's just easy accessible. You can just read it when, when and whenever you want. Um, but I think, you know, in, in the sick part, a lot of scholarly books and a lot of books about history, you know, it's, a, it's paid content. You can't get PDFs of like written article, articles or books from like the 1900s online. And you find plenty of them actually, but 
um, the idea of copywriting or the idea of like having sort of selling books. Um, I've been well researched, for example, um, there was recently a book about um, the Sikh Empire by uh, Priya Atwal, and she, the rules of rebels, I think it was, and I've purchased a book, I've been reading a couple of pages right now, it's quite good, I'm really enjoying it, and it's, it's, I'm glad I bought it, because also it supports uh, her and her research. Um, but I think, yeah, that sort of balance is, I think it does exist, if you want to learn more, if you want to dive into the, the sort of, you know, the, the nitty gritty, if you will. Um, like I mentioned before, but Rambling was sick as well. He has like a whole book page. He sells loads of books on content of Sikhi, um, Sikh philosophy, the gurus, history, everything. Um, so, yeah. I suppose then the question is about the purpose of education. What is the purpose, you know, for us to read, you know, this literature that's available, whether it's paid or, you know, whether we need to pay for it or we don't need to pay. What is our purpose? Is the purpose of education, for example, you doing a, a university qualification, what is the purpose of that? Is the purpose of that to gain a higher standard of living or is the purpose of that to gain truth and wisdom? Because they're two very, dis well, they can be integrated and let's, let's see, if we can be searching for truth and wisdom and at the same time prosperity and and material wealth you know because that's we're, we're taught in Sikhi to think about material and also spiritual but for some people the purpose of education seems to veer in one direction well my my education is so that I can get a good job so I can buy a, a nice house and then a bigger house and and so so the purpose of learning the purpose of training seems to be simply focused on material gain whereas another way of looking at it like Sikhi for example we may not be searching for material gain what is it that we're looking for is it truth and wisdom or is it both I think um well, from my point of view I think it's I think it's um so just the truth and wisdom like when you learn the history you learn, you learn the sort of heroic stories of like amazing figures in, in um in Sikhi that like you can kind of you're inspired by their teachings and you want to sort of be like them. We can never be like them, but we can take their sort of, their sort of virtues and try and implement it in our life. Um, but also you sort of equip yourself with knowledge as well. So for example, if somebody asks you about something regarding Sikh or Sikh history, you have the competency to answer that question. And truthfully as well, because you could always just lie to them, but then you're kind of devaluing yourself as a Sikh and a Sikh is not supposed to lie. So, um, I think it depends. I think it depends on people's outlook. Because some someone might be paid to write a piece of like uh, a research paper, so they, they'll, they'll get funded for it, and then they so they kind of see it as both as a sort of material gain and also like a spiritual wisdom gain. But I think for me on a first level, it's more like a spiritual and wisdom gain because I love to read history. I really, actually really do enjoy it. It's like a hobby. I try and dedicate time if I can. Obviously, when it's not too busy uh, to read at least like a couple of pages kind of just get the teaching from them, just kind of improve myself as a person as well from the teaching of our ancestors. So do you feel that, you know, the course you're doing at the university, do you feel that that gives you spiritual, um, you know, prosperity as well? Or, or do you kind of rely on learning about Sikhi for spiritual and learning about, you know, the material kind of the scientific method of way of doing things in your university education? Or can you integrate the two? With the university work, I'd probably say it's more on sort of this materialistic side, but I, there are elements of spiritual ways. Like when we learn about sort of um, like, move, like righteous movements that have happened in history, or like you know business ethics, for example, how to be how to run a business eth ethically and like women's equality in the workplace. Um, and this kind of goes into that learning about the temporal aspect of the world, and you know, kind of getting involved in politics slightly. Um, and how we interact with humans, with other humans, and on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but most of it, majority, majority of it is material gain, because obviously my degree, once I get my degree, I can progress in the workplace and in, in the field and my career, um, compared to when I read Sikh history, you know, I don't envision myself to be a Sikh historian in the future. I mean, that would be nice, but <laughs> in terms of planning, I don't see, you know, it's not something I'd probably... If someone asks me, would you like to be a Sikh historian? I'd be like, oh, that'd be interesting. But it's not something that I'm kind of working towards. It's just kind of like a hobby thing. It's just, like, there's no pressure. There's no sort of expectation. It's just like, read at leisure, learn at leisure, and just continue sort of growing. And then the way we learn, 
um, at the university, for example, um, rationality, logic, analysis, those are all skills that you are expected to develop through, through your university course. And we don't learn everything that way. You know, not everything we learn can be learned through rational uh, or logic or analysis. And some of our wisdom comes from intuition. Some of our wisdom comes from simply absorbing knowledge from others, experiential learning, as it were, you know, just being with the Sangat. And we learn through, through the presence of others who know more than we do. So how do we reconcile that, those different ways of learning, the intuitive way of learning, as opposed to the logical way of learning? How do we marry the two together? I think a mixture of both is, is really important. So obviously, like, or discourse and also reading on your own as well because obviously like, there might be some things that you discuss that you might be like oh i want to research that more and the person that's discussing it might not have the information on it so you could read it and you could also expand your knowledge because yeah reading is actually really a really powerful skill uh, i wish i probably did it sooner but i only started reading books i, I was big into video games right um so I, I suddenly started reading books and when i got to like sick history and stuff um but the combination of two, but also we have the advantage of technology, like you mentioned, so we can watch documentaries or listen to podcasts while we're going to like, you know, our commute to work or just like a, wherever and whenever. Um, so we have like a lot of uh, uh, facilities in place to, con to keep learning. But I think a mixture is always very useful um, because it keeps things fresh, it keeps things exciting. And also um, like having discourse also kind of builds that sort of like a communication skill as well. So when you talk to other like non six of our history, like, how do you communicate in what way do you communicate so it's, maybe they can relate to it as well yeah when you talk about communication there's you know um there are techniques that we can use in our communication sometimes we can use symbology and metaphors and and another way of communicating is using very precise and specific words to be articulate so for you i mean obviously both are important it's important to be able to enrich the way we communicate using these um, these devices, these rhetorical devices such as symbology and metaphors and whatever, and at the same time being precise and accurate and knowing exactly which word we need to use. Because you see, very often we have experiences, and but unless we have the words and the wisdom to um, to be able to express what we're saying, we, we don't. Sometimes we don't have the right words to express what we're feeling and what we're thinking. And you know, education is really important for that, isn't it? To give us the tools and the techniques to be able to communicate what we need to communicate. So for you, as a, as a graduate, as a young graduate, you know, how do you balance the, you know, the rhetoric, the discourse and enrich it using a combination of uh, both symbology and, and precise words being articulate using that? who I'm talking to. So for example, if I'm at work, I'm talking to someone who's fresh and sicky. Um, I usually don't say sick, I'll say sick because they can resonate because if I say sick, they kind of like look at me like, what's that? I'm sick? What are you feeling about? <laughs> so they, but it's, it's um, so I need to like, so the language I use, I need to be um, more sort of down to earth because for example, I don't know what the position might be, whether the atheist, what religion they are, they, you know, um, you know what they're going through in life they might be like going through hardship and they might be questioning the existence of god and stuff um, so we need to be like very sort of uh, like kind of like diplomatic in a sense um, but also we don't want to offend anyone as well but we want to get the message across it's kind of like a fine line sort of thing um, that's why it's like when i talk to people at Sikhi at work i just i talk about the basics and then if they have further interest they start asking me questions and answer them and then Sometimes there's questions I don't know, so I, have to, like, I, I tell them, like, you know, let me research myself and I'll come back to you on that. Um, but, you know, with my friends, it's more sort of like when we talk about like social justice movements or like, for example, like, we live in London, so like knife crime is quite, especially in East London, where my uni is based, uh, there's a lot of knife crime. And um, obviously because six where they get barn and stuff, so they asked me questions about that. They said, you know, is, you know, this whole knife crime thing, why do six wear like they get barn? Isn't that counterintuitive to the whole cause? But I said, well, and, you know, you know, in hindsight, you might think that's true, but the, the Sikh Kirban is a completely different, like the symbol of the Kirban is, a, is regarding self-defense and the protection of others, not just ourselves. And also, the, I don't think there's been an incident in the UK where Kirban has been misused in the hundreds of years that Sikhs have been here. 
actually no, 150, because the Leipzig came in 1850, I think. Um, and then they're like, oh, okay, that's interesting. But yeah, it's just, it depends on who you're talking to. Uh, it depends on the sort of relationship you have with that person. Like some of my friends, like we just always banter all the time, so always having jokes and stuff. So um, I'm more open to talking to them, like on that sort of level, about Siki. Um, but yeah, that's the answer to the question. Mm, yeah, that's that's fine. And, and there's this thing about categorization as well. You talked earlier about the interfaith group that you you went to, and um, and so we can start. We can. It seems from what I've gathered, like when the British were colonizing India, they categorized us into like you know these are Jats and these are. Ramgarhia and these are you know like they categorized us they they created like this census which we'd never had before apparently and with that census people were identified in terms of their castes and their their religions and whereas actually the the boundaries between these different categories were much more blurred you know before the British started to kind of define these strong categories and so when we think about the interfaith groups do you think like the connections between the different people you know sometimes the connections can be more important than the categories that they belong in and and you know obviously both connections and categories are important but how do we how do we synthesize the importance of you know knowing that the category is not you know it's not uh, if we only isolate people based on their categories like that person is a Muslim, then therefore they're not a Sikh. For you know, there are connections between them because we we're both Punjabi, for example. You see, so you know, one person could be more focused on the connect connections of culture, and another person could be focused on the distinctions, the the divides between them because they are categorically different. And so, how do we use these two concepts of categories and connections to to synthesize and to see the world in a in a broader paradigm? Since I've been researching history and Punjab's history in particular and partition and stuff, like, I do feel more connected with like just general Punjabis, like, whether it's Hindu Punjabis or Muslim Punjabis, because like we do come from the same sort of motherland. We kind of live like the same sort of lifestyle. The only difference is religion, but we've lived together um, for hundreds of years. Um, and obviously, like I said, like I love the Sikh Empire and I love like reading about it and history about it and you know how progressive and how tolerant it was as an empire. All of the Sikhs were running the empire. It was you know, Muslims and Hindus were in the were high in high positions of the courts and stuff. Um, but yeah, mainly when I go to university because this is quite a rich like, Asian community at Queen Mary's. Uh, a lot of the times like, I meet someone from Pakistan, I'm like, where are you from? They're like, oh, Punjab, Pakistan. Like, oh, Sikh, I'm from India, Pakistan. And we start vibing and we start like, you know, like, how many roti is Like, just start, you know, having banter. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's, for me, it's more the cultural. Uh, I look like, with it, like, you know, I found that connection of being Punjabi because obviously there's not many Sikhs in the UK. Well, I mean, I mean there's quite a lot to be fair, but um, where I work in particular, uh, there's not many. And so, you know, for me, someone that's like, Punjabi, we can just vibe on a whole other level. We start speaking like Punjabi or Urdu, like there's a mixture. We can understand each other. It's quite similar, uh, so it's quite it's quite funny actually. But um, I think yeah, so for me it's like cultural sort of thing. And then um, but also you, I always think how they like you know the message of Sikhi, like we sh there is no caste, there is no sort of division. Like as Sikhs, we see the light of God in everyone. Um, so although some might say I'm a Hindu or Muslim, you know that doesn't mean that. You know that's what they believe that's fine but we'd still serve them and we should them save them to our lovers if they were like family to us you know that's the sort of level we're trying to achieve at six so. yeah because culture is more of um like a consciousness isn't it you know we have a shared culture and that culture doesn't have those rigid boundaries of categorization and so consciousness is is a kind of energy and energy doesn't have boundaries you know energy is just it's all kind of interconnected and you know how do you you know how do you divide like the Punjabi energy from Urdu energy or Muslim energy you know it's like energy is just energy isn't it and and then we have like the focus on bodies you know like which is matter which is the tangible you know and it's like you can you can say like this person is um again with this categorization we can categorize people into different races into different boxes and but we can't put 
culture into a box like that you know so how do we connect the consciousness with the material kind of tangible bodies yeah. matter i think it's a good question and i think i probably can't even think of an answer to it um because it's, it's, it's the way you sort of structured it is it's quite unique and i've never sort of thought of it like that i don't have but it's just mm, I'm not sure, I can't say. Vibe, you know, because you mentioned the word the vibe, you know, like yeah. you meet somebody and you can kind of feel a good vibe with, with them and you feel like that connection with them and, and that connection is based on the vibe rather than the tangible, you know, they might look very different to yourself or very mm -hmm. similar to yourself, you know, it doesn't, but it's not based on how, you don't feel that connection based on how they look, you feel that connection based on the vibe that you get. Yeah, I, I you also not, but also vibe, but also like just the commonality, commonality as well. Like I mentioned, like the band we have, like how I many rupees, what's your favorite doll and stuff. Uh, it's just like because they can relate to it, you know, and they can relate to the lifestyle, um, but they can also relate to like the trials and tribulations. Like we, I had conversations with like, some like uh, um, Punjabis from Pakistan, and we talked about partition, and they told me their stories, and you know, I told them my story, my family stories. And those are sort of like, we both sort of identified that partition was like, it was a, it was a terrible thing um, in terms of like the bloodshed and people were killed and all that sort of horrible things that happened. And we could sort of sympathize with each other because, you know, our families kind of same sort of, um, the, the things they experienced were similar. Um, but I think in, in a weird sense, that kind of brought, brought us like our friendship closer as well, because it's like, well, I can relate to you, you can relate to me. We're from the same sort of place. We have the same sort of foods and, uh culture and stuff um yeah you talk about stories and so there's another kind of difference in terms of um how we learn you know we, we can learn so much about each other through our stories and the poetry and and the arts and and then there's the scientific method which is kind of different to a, a very different way of learning and when you talk about the partition it's as though the scientific method was used for that partition because it's like, well, we, you know, where where shall we draw this line? And it was like, you know, creating like an efficient line based on population. You know, who are they? Mostly Muslims or or Hindus or Sikhs, and mostly Muslims there. So let's draw the line there. And you know that so that line was drawn kind of quite ruthlessly, using a very analytical kind of scientific method with that with total disregard to people's stories you know most of like Guru Nanak Dev Ji's birthplace now is in Pakistan and whereas the Sikhs were moved to India and it's like we we lost our stories you know that our stories were carved into but the method that was used to draw that line you know that that kind of quite barbaric line was um, was based on a on a scientific method of logic, rationale, analysis, wasn't it? And and how do we use both methods? You know, how do we respect and appreciate not only the scientific method but the stories that um, that create kind of the impact and and untold kind of joy and untold misery? You know, if we if we kind of don't do things in an ethical way. History, it comes back to history, right? Because um, you learn about partition and what went, what, what, what happened, and how did it work, and you know, you know, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, like how did he lobby? He came to London, and he did so much to, to lobby for Pakistan because he had that sort of foresight. And he knew what was going to happen had they kind of stayed with India. Um, so, yeah, just learning history, I guess, because um, again, you can relate to people, you can talk to them. Someone might say, "Well, I think partition is a good thing," but you could sort of argue against it. You argue for it. You know, you can have that sort of discourse. Um, and then you can kind of like end it in an old Punjabi fashion way of like just hugging it out and you know, <laughs> sort of like just again vibing. Um, well, they were all but, educated in Britain, weren't they? You know, Nehru was educated in Britain, Jinnah was educated in Britain, Gandhi was educated in the West. And so they all kind of seem to look at things with a Western kind of mindset, didn't they? Maybe mm -hmm. not Gandhi in his later life, you know, Gandhi kind of changed his paradigm I suppose but in a way that's also why they were being listened to because they were using the same kind of language that the British were 
were, were using. So they were able to talk using, you know, like not only because they were speaking in English, but they were use they were using um, an English kind of lens in trying to gain what they wanted. And so they didn't seem to care about the fact that people's stories were going to be divided, that families were going to be right. divided. And so they, you know, because they they just seem to have like, well, you know, this we want like Pakistan, we, we want a land where the Muslims will be majority. Let's draw a line here. You know, because they accepted it, didn't they? You know, they they accepted those plans, they accepted those divisions. Sorry, Arvinda, but yeah, that wasn't really formulated as a question, but my question was about, well, how do we, you know, how do we avoid making that those mistakes where we only look at things from one paradigm, from one perspective, you know, because we're, we're in the fortunate privileged position to be able to look at things from different perspectives, aren't we? Because we have the benefit of not only a Western education, we have the benefit of Sikhi education as well. You know, so we, we, we don't, you know, there, there's no excuses for us not to be able to see things from different points of view. Exactly that. And it's, 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 I think it's good to be uh, quite critical as well. The source of history you read as well, it's good to get pers perspective on both sides. So, you know, when I research about Sikh history, I always look at the sort of what the English said as well, because there's many accounts of, you know, the British and when they came to Punjab, the anglo Sikh wars. Um, I think yeah, it's, it's good to be critical and understand both sides of the argument because it's easy to say, like, for example, when I was younger, like our grandparents would tell stories about the partition, my grandma in particular, and then it's, that's kind of ingrained in my mind. So I kind of see them as the enemy, but they need to have discourse with someone else from the other side. And they're like, but this happened to us. And you're like, oh, whoa, I had no idea, you know, because you, you'd be, you kind of be painted as the enemy. And then kind of build, again, you put that tolerance for, through like conversation and you understand that it was a horrible thing as a whole. No one really gained anything from it. Um, I mean, the countries were formed and, um, you know, you, some could argue if they're actually successful, they kind of fulfilled their objectives. But, um, you know, it's, it all comes down to history. And I'm so like into history and I was just like, I keep saying it, but um, yeah, just understanding perspectives and having conversations from a different point of view as well. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Arvinda. That's been a very stimulating conversation. I've really enjoyed speaking with you. Likewise, thank I you so much. I look forward to the next one.